So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to talk about um, navigating uh, and connecting to NERSC. Um, and I did uh, upload these slides um, to the new user training webpage. Um, so if you want to follow along, you can do that. Um, OK, so today we're going to talk about your account setup, a little bit more information about NERSC accounts. We're going to talk about something called IRIS. So I'm going to explain what that is. And then um, we're going to actually see how to connect to our system um, and a few other ways of connecting. Um, we're going to talk about SSH, um, Jupyter, and um, something called No Machine. And we'll, I'll go a little bit more into detail about some of the things that um, Rebecca mentioned about user tickets and then um, also our doc documentation and our homepage. So this is just covering kind of all aspects of navigating um, all of the different resources at NERSC, including the computational resources. Um, so some information to know about um, accounts. So there's kind of two different things here. So there's accounts and allocations. So your account is like, your personal account. So this has a login and a username, and this is how you authenticate to the system, and it will have certain permissions. So it will say, okay, you're able to access this resource and so forth. Um, and then there are uh, some, some people have like special roles, which give them access to more um, uh, abilities, which are uh, principal investigators and project managers. Um, so if you're a student, you you probably don't have uh, these um, same uh, uh, authorizations, um, but someone will, one of those people will have sent you a link to get your account. So if you have an account, that's probably how you got it. And um, then a project allocation is basically like the bank account that you use to pay for the compute time. So Rebecca mentioned we have these allocations. Sometimes they're, they're measured in node hours. And that's um, how we keep track of like who's using the system, how much they've used, how much they still can use. Um, so it's basically the same as a bank account. We give everybody a bunch of money, AKA note hours, and then they can spend it on our system. Um, so you'll all definitely be in at least one project, sometimes more. Um, and that means that you can like pick which, like if you're doing work on one project that so you would sort of charge to that account. And then if you are working on a different project, you might charge to a different one. Um, but you probably have a default project. And I'll actually mention how if you, for some reason, have multiple projects, if you need to switch between them, um, you can, well, you could just specify a default if you wanted. Um, so everybody will need to agree to this appropriate use of NERSC resources. Um, so this is automatic if you, um, Probably if you have set up your account, you will be asked to do this. Um, and it's just a pretty seamless. Um, if you are unsure if you've completed, I mean, read, read and agreed to it, um, we can check that for you later. But if you have signed into the system, um, like you can't sign into Perlmutter unless you have agreed to this. So if you are able to sign into Perlmutter, then you probably have agreed to this. But um, I would definitely recommend checking it out and just making sure that whatever work you're doing, um, uh, you know, conforms to this. So um, security is really, really important. Um, and so having a password and changing it every year, um, you, you will be made to do this. Um, make sure you don't share your password, make sure you're not, um, you know, emailing them to yourself or anything like that. Um, and make sure to use a really good password. So good passwords are usually um, a bunch of different numbers and letters that are kind of totally random and, you know, not something that um, someone could guess just by like knowing you. It's like it's not your initials or something like that. Um, or it could be several random words and letters. Um, I actually, I like to do this. Um, and that way it's easier because I can't like remember a bunch of random numbers and letters, uh, but I can remember like some kind of phrase of random words. So I personally like to do that. Um, and that can also be really secure. Um, your account might get locked after consecutive login failures. So if you think this has happened, there's a couple things you can do. Um, we're going to, again, we're going to talk about this thing called Iris in a moment. So you may not know what this is and that's okay, but it's kind of like a, a little, um, uh, another resource that we have that will help you with um, clearing those login failures. Um, there's a way if you forget your 
password, this is also where you'll want to go. And um, there's like a, like in a lot of, if you go online and you need to sign in somewhere and you realize you forgot your password, there's always that forgot password button. Um, that's basically going to be here in Iris. Um, but then you can also, if you're having problems, um, submit a help ticket. And actually we get a lot of tickets like that. They're like, I can't log in. And we can either help you um, by sending you that reset password um, or, you know, just checking what's going on. Um, right. So just remember that you don't want to use any passwords that are really obvious, um, you know, nurse password or anything like that. That would be um, really uh, insecure password. Um, so just remember that you, to use a really strong password. Um, interestingly enough, we don't have requirements. Um, like we don't tell you you have to use a capital and a lowercase and, and that kind of thing. Um, but we just encourage people to, to make a good choice. Um, so how many people have heard of or have used um, uh, multi-factor authentication? Um, I see someone has raised their hand in the room and online, people have used it. Okay, good. So that's great. If you're not using multi-factor authentication, maybe by the next slide, you will have changed your mind about using it. Um, I definitely did. I I mean, you have to use it for our systems. Um, you know, there's this old news article from 2020 about a supercomputer that got hacked and was being used to mine cryptocurrency. This is a very big reason we need to make sure our system stays secure. Um, and that's what MFA is required. But um, this is actually a screenshot from this past weekend. Um, and even a, a before, this is my own screenshot from my phone. And this is someone trying to hack into my Discord account. Um, and they are uh, failing because um, my MFA is getting sent to my phone. So I was literally watching in real time. Uh, somebody was trying to hack into my Discord. <laughs> Um, okay, great. There's a poll. So do you have MFA usage experience before nurse? Okay, almost a lot of people do, and some people don't. Um, you can actually now use MFA for, like I said, like I'm using it for my Discord. Um, you can use it for all kinds of different accounts. Um, I would definitely recommend if you have, um, so let's see, can I share these results with everybody? Yeah, so it looks like just a couple people don't have experience using MFA. Um, so hopefully my anecdotal experience here will encourage you um, to set up MFA uh, for uh, important things that you don't want to lose access to. Um, so it was really great to see that uh, my Discord wasn't successfully hacked. Um, and so the way to set it up is using something called Iris, but we have set this word a lot and we haven't talked about what it actually is. So let's talk about Iris. Um, so I'm going to describe what IRIS is. Um, it's kind of like a lab notebook for nurse resource tracking and management. Um, so, you know, when you're doing your research, if you do any kind of um, like lab research, um, you might have a lab notebook. Um, or even if you're doing computer research, you probably have a place where you kind of like take notes and keep track of stuff. And so IRIS is our system for doing that. And um you'll want to, um, you know, get familiar with this and you'll have to in order to change your password and set up your multi-factor authentication. Uh, but there's a lot of information in there that might be useful to you, um, including it will actually have an entire history of all of your jobs. So when, when you learn about what jobs are, jobs are your computational work. So you'll sort of submit it to the system and it'll run. Um, those are called jobs. And again, we'll cover that in detail later. Uh, but but Iris will actually show you all of all of those. All of those. Oh, oh I'm, I'm... Um, okay, thanks. Um so uh you get to Iris similar to most things at NERSC, it's iris.nurse.gov. And um, as I mentioned, there's like all these buttons here, which make your life much easier. If you forgot your password or your username or something's not working, this is probably the place you want to go to get started. Um, when you click on login, you're going to get shown this federated ID um, uh, login page, and you're going to want to pick NERSC um, because you're using your NERSC credentials to log in. So make sure when you 
choose your institution, you're, you're using NERSC and not um, a different institution. And then you're gonna just enter your password, your username and password here. Um, so it's not gonna ask you for your uh, one-time password or your MFA quite yet, first username and password. Then you press login. Um, for the first time, of course, the very first time when you're, you've just gotten your new uh, account, you won't have an MFA set up yet. So it's not gonna ask you your first time. First, you're just gonna get in there because um, you have to go set it up. Um, so one thing you can do beforehand is go get this um, app on your smartphone, which is called Google Authenticator. Again, the point is that you're sort of separating the lock from the key. So you're, you're, you're taking your, your lock is, you know, NERSC and your key now is going to be something else. Like instead of your computer, um, it'll be your phone. Now, some people do have um, apps like a Google Authenticator type app on their um, computer so that they can like copy and paste the code. Um, but actually we recommend you having it on your smartphone. Um, that way, again, kind of that separating the lock from the key type of, um, mentality. So this, uh, app works on Apple and Android. Um, and, uh, the way it works, I'm going to show you what the setup is, but just so you have a sense of what it will look like, um, this, these codes in this authenticator app, once you have it connected to NERS, so this is my example, like, this isn't actually mine, but mine has several because I use it for NERSC, I use it for my like work, my Lawrence Berkeley lab, and for example, my Discord and actually like my GitHub, I have it set up for all of these. So you'll have all these different numbers on your screen and each one is only gonna be valid for 30 seconds at a time. And this is, it's really hard to see, but this is actually a little count on clock. Um, so it's counting down every time it changes, the, the 30 seconds starts over. And so you have 30 seconds to enter this um, into your, um, what it's called your one-time password because it's just one time. <laughs> um, okay, so now you have this set. So, so, you're, so when you first get the app, it's not gonna have any numbers set up if you're just getting the app for the first time, um, but you just wanna have it installed because you're gonna need it. Um, <laughs> Now go back to Iris. Um, and for the record, we're gonna hopefully give you some time to set this up. You can do it now while I'm talking too. You can do it as we speak. Um, but later on, we have some time in our hands-on where you can actually set this up and we'll help you if you need help. Um, and so you're gonna go back to Iris and you'll see in there, there's a tab that's called MFA and you'll see a button that's called add token. Then it'll show up this little screen and you're gonna scan the QR code with the Authenticator app. Um, and actually this is obsolete. Now we don't have this Authy support anymore, I believe. So I apologize, I forgot to remove that. Um, you're just gonna scan that QR code with the Authenticator app to make sure you have the app open and you scan it. And that's it, that will actually do the setup for you. So then you now, as soon as you do that, that's the only thing you have to do is scan this QR code and now you will see your one-time password um, appearing on your Authenticator app. And it'll say something around it. It's going to say a couple different letters and stuff, but some part of it will say NERSC. Um, so you can identify that that's your NERSC password. Because um, if you didn't have these labeled, that would be really difficult. So it will have some kind of label telling you which one is which. And then um, the next time you um, uh, sign in, you will be asked... Uh, your one-time password as well. <clears throat> so if you have your nurse log, uh, credentials, have you been able to log into Iris? Okay, so far, okay, a couple of people haven't. Okay, so looks like um, most people who 92% said that they have been able to log into Iris and a couple of people said they haven't been able to. Um, so that's okay. You, If you need help, we'll help you at the, at the end. Cool. Um, just a couple of things. Um, Actually, I'm going to skip this for now. Let's just keep going for now. Um, so at the top, there's a bunch. Of, so I would recommend the, the best thing to do um, when you have time is to just go click around in Iris. Um, for the most part, as long as you're not really like 
changing any numbers or anything, it shouldn't super matter. You can just go and look and see, um, you know, what groups you're part of, how much storage you've been given, um, you know, how much uh, uh, CPU hours and GPU hours you have. You can just kind of click around and, and explore a little bit. Um, you can find some account details. This is where you can change your default. Um, so this is under, um, actually it might be under groups. Um, I guess I'm on the CPU tab here. I don't remember exactly. <laughs> like I said, I just usually click around. Um, but you can change which one is your default account. If you are part of multiple, it's possible you won't be and then it won't matter. Um, you can check on um, like your your full, if, you, if you're curious how much the allocation is for a certain project, you can go and find out. Um, so all of this information, like I said, all of that tracking like lab notebook type of information is here in Iris. Um, and then if, if you uh, are interested, this might be something that's advanced if you don't know what a shell is or changing your default shell isn't important to you because you don't know what that is. Don't worry about it. But if you do have a, a shell that you prefer, um, the, I, the default is bash, um, but you can change it here um, in uh, in Iris. Um, I don't remember exactly which tab this is though. Um, so if you need if you need to do this, um, you can ask somebody which tab this is. But um, if you, you most people, I, I mean, not, maybe not most people, but many of our users just use default, the default, which is bash, um, including myself. So uh, yeah, and then, okay, let's get that. Okay, so let's actually talk about connecting to NERSC. Um, and, but my question for you first is, um, how many of you have seen this movie, The Martian? I see one person has seen it. Okay. If you haven't seen this movie, that's okay. It is a great movie though. I, I love this movie so much. Um, but uh, Matt Damon is stuck on Mars and um, it's a very, it's very, I mean, people, we got to save him. And um, uh, there's a, a character who is um, uh, trying to calculate a trajectory to get Matt Damon back to earth. And his calculation is really massive calculation. It's like he's, and he's using the supercomputer at NASA. So this, I don't know if they actually shot it at NASA, but that's where it claims he is. Um, and in order to do this, he seems to have taken his laptop and he has connected some random cable from his laptop to a server rack. Um, and uh, the other amazing thing is at the end, his he gets a little box that says his calculations are correct, which I'm not really sure how that works out at all. But um, the point of this is to say none of this is accurate. And um, you absolutely will not be connecting to an HPC resource by taking some random cable from your laptop and plugging it into a server rack. Um, so as much as I love this movie, this is really, really wrong. And it's very funny when you watch movies like this and you know what you're, you know, you know how to use those resources and you're like, wow, this is so inaccurate. Um, so luckily for you, you don't have to do this. Um, so this is an example of what not to do. And what you will want to do is way easier. Um, you will want to have an internet connection and a laptop or computer with something called a terminal. And of course, you'll want to have your username, your password, and that multi-factor authentication method. Um, so to actually learn how to do this, we're going to watch this fantastic video. I believe the sound should work. Um, let's try it and see. Welcome to NERSC. In this video, you will learn how to log into NERSC systems. NERSC is the Scientific Computing Center at Berkeley Lab, the national lab with the best views. Can someone tell me if the sound is working? Yeah, we are good. Oh, great. As you can see. NERSC is located on the beautiful hills here in Berkeley, and our current system is called Permature. My name is Lisa, I'm a performance engineer at NERSC, and I will guide you through the process of logging into Permature with the SSH command. To get started, we need to open the terminal. If you are unfamiliar with using a terminal, you can learn more through the HPC Carpentries workshop that's linked in the video description below. 
Also, make sure you know your nurse username and your password and have your MFA or multi-factor authenticator app set up. If you don't have any of those available, check out our documentation at docs.nurse.gov slash getting started. All right, I think we are ready. I open my terminal and type SSH and then my nurse username is Elvis. So I type Elvis at permature.nurse.gov. If this is too long for you, you can replace permature with Sol. Fun fact, permature is named in honor of Sol permature, an astrophysicist at Berkeley Lab. He insisted on giving users the option of using Sol instead of permature to log in, since Sol is quicker to type than permature. Now hit the enter key, and if this is your first time signing on to Permuter, you will be asked to add an RSA fingerprint. Please type yes and press the enter key. The fingerprint will be added and in future you will not be asked again. Now you will be asked for your password and your OTP. OTP stands for one-time password. The OTP is obtained from the multi-factor authenticator app. It will be a six-digit number that changes every 30 seconds. If your password is, for example, ABCDEF and the OTP is 919-595, type in ABCDEF 919-595 and press the enter key. Yay, congrats, you made it. You are now logged into Perimeter. To be precise, you are in a Perimeter login note. If you encounter any issues logging in, check out our documentation on troubleshooting or submit a ticket to the nurse help desk. If you have comments or requests for additional videos, contact us at nurse-user-videos at lbl.com. Great, all right. So, um, yeah, so um, just remember that you're uh, gonna log in. Um, one, one way to log in is using uh, the terminal. Um, you just saw um, how Lisa showed uh, to do that using probably the default. Um, the video is on our YouTube. So if you find the NERSC YouTube channel, maybe someone can uh, pop it in uh, the chat. The video is, is on our YouTube. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different terminal programs. Um, so if you're using a Mac, there's a built-in one, or you can get kind of a fancier one. If you're on Windows, you can use Putty, um, or there's a a couple other ones. Um, it sounds like um, Chromebook has its own. There's a couple different things. Um, so usually getting a terminal program is um, pretty straightforward. And, uh, oops, sorry. oh my gosh. Yeah, and then you're just gonna do basically exactly what uh, Lisa showed in the video. You're gonna type SSH, your, your um, uh, username, and uh, that's how you're gonna sign in. But I wanted to show actually another way to sign in. Um, and also, by the way, during our hands-on session today, um, our amazing uh, coworker, Eric, is going to show you again how to sign in. So if you didn't catch that or you need more help, again, we're going to do it again together. Um, but I also want to show another way to sign in, which is using Jupyter. So you can go to jupyter.nurse.gov. And um, if you haven't used Jupyter Hub before, it's kind of a... a well, it is a graphical interface that you can pull up in your web browser, and it's a way to log in to the system via web browser instead of um, through your terminal. Um, you can actually access a terminal um, in the web browser uh, through Jupyter, and that would be equivalent to a terminal um, like from your local system that is then SSH'd into Perlmutter. Um, so it's um, just another equivalent way of accessing the system. Um, but it's also really good for any type of sort of interactive coding. If you want to open, if you're familiar with a Python notebook, um, similar to like what Colab is, like Google Colab, these are notebooks where you can kind of be like coding and then um, actually running little cells of uh, blocks of code. Um, that's something that Jupyter uh, supports. And um, that's another way to log in. And this is um, going to ask you same information, username, password, OTP. It's exactly the same um, across the different methods. Um, so if you're running purely command line, um, 
you can use Jupyter, you can use Terminal, whatever. Um, but if you're going to be running any application that has a GUI, so for example, if you're running MATLAB or if you need to run, there's a debugging software or a performance software, um, they can be really, really slow over the network, um, over the external network. And I'll show you that in a moment. Um, so uh, there is a way to do this that will be a little bit faster and less painful. Um, again, this is, I think, in general, probably used mostly by MATLAB users, but it could be for any other application where there's a GUI, a graphical user interface. Um, okay, so let's talk about no machine. So if you're running, um, so a couple, couple things. Um, the If you're running some kind of GUI on the system, um, the protocol that is usually used to forward that uh, data so that you can see it on your own screen is something called X, X protocol. And um, it's, it's you know, we have a very fast network inside of NERSC. You saw that ESnet, you know, network that we had is super, super fast and, and the interconnect and all of that data moves really, really fast on um, uh, NERSC. But then when it gets to the, you know, external internet and your internet, for example, it will be, excuse me, really, really slow and, you know, very laggy. So like, you'll be trying to like move your mouse to click on something within the GUI and it'll just take a really long time. So it's really um, uh, hard to uh, use a GUI if you're having, if you're using the X protocol to, to forward it to your screen. Um, but instead we offer something called no machine or sometimes it's called NX and it has a slightly different protocol where it will actually run the X server on the system um, and then forward a much uh, like a much more optimized amount of data to your screen. So it's really fast because it's sending way less information on the slow internet, which is like the external internet. So what we would recommend is um, that if you're going to be running any kind of GUI, you do it on um, using this no machine uh, protocol. Um, it's also going to make things easier for you because um, if your connection dies or anything like that, um, your um, your protocol will end, your session will end. Whereas if you're using no machine, if even if your internet is a little unstable. Um, the no machine session will still be running. So you can actually get back into it and check on the progress of whatever it was you were running um, because it it doesn't have this really um, fragile sort of uh, phase transition from fast network to slow network. Um, so there are details on how to set this up um, again in, in our documentation. And I, I will talk a little bit more about our documentation in a moment. But if you think that you're going to be using any kind of GUI application, I would highly recommend um, go to our documentation and look up this thing called No Machine. Um, but if you have these slides, you can also use these links here. Um, and it walks you through how to set that up. Um, okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about submitting help tickets. Um, just a little bit more details from what Rebecca showed. So again, if you missed it, this is what our help portal looks like. You uh, will want to go to help.nurse.gov. And there's actually a couple things here that you may want, uh, that you may need access to. Um, yeah, oh, yeah there's no more time uh, in the last two weeks, right? Uh, he made a change. OK. Um, I couldn't tell if there was a question. Um, just remember to use the Q&A app, uh, Q&A doc, or um, you could put it in chat and someone else will take a look at it. Um, so you can click this open open ticket but button if you have a ticket you want to ask a question. Um, or there's a couple different types of requests. Um, so we'll talk about what these quota increases are in a little bit. But if you need to ask for more storage space on the system, um, this is where you'll do that as well. So keep um, this uh, help.nurse.gov handy uh, because there's a couple different things that you can do through here. Um, so one of those things, like I said, there was like these open requests. Um, and if you need to ask for more storage, um, you would do that through here as well. There's basically a link for a storage quota increase. So it's really important to us that you, you give us a good ticket to start with because um, we want to be able to help you as quickly as possible. Um, so make sure, uh, like Rebecca was saying, include, um, in, in general, it's better to include more information than less. Um, you know, even if it feels like 
for some reason you don't think it would be relevant, um, you'd be surprised if you just give us a bunch of information. We're pretty good at actually parsing through what's important and what isn't. Um, but it's always more helpful to have more information and then be like, oh, no, this is the only thing that really is helpful here, rather than just getting like one piece of information and it just not being really helpful to us. So uh, when in doubt, less is more or more is more. <laughs> um, and just, you know, put error messages, job IDs, like, Tell us where things are on the system. Um, show us what modules you're using. Even some steps like, okay, this is what I signed in. I went here and I did this. Um, uh, screenshots are actually not very helpful to us because sometimes they're not very easy to read. It can totally depend on your your screen, um, you know, and then also we can't copy and paste from an image. So if you send me an image, if, so unless it's something that you can't, like isn't words, it's like, something you need us to look at for some reason. Um, but uh, if it's commands that you're typing in your terminal, just copy and paste them because we will probably just end up copying and pasting them and trying it ourselves. And we can't do that from a screenshot. So don't include screenshots unless for some reason it's like, you really, it's like a purely visual thing. Um, you know, things are hard for us to troubleshoot if they're really generic, um, like my code is slow or my job won't start, Perlmutter is broken, right? Those are, that's, we're just going to message you back in four hours or up to four hours saying, well, what did you try? What did you do? Um, but it's much easier if you tell us, hey, this is my job ID. It's running way slower than this. Um, which is the same, you know, and it was the same exact script or, you know, it's located here. It's well, this is back when we had two systems, you know, it's working. This is the error message or, you know, I'm running this and it's getting this error message. Um, you know, this kind of stuff, even if it's a really long error message is usually more helpful um, because then we can actually try to see like, okay, was it one error, one error that actually led to a bunch of different errors. And actually the first error is the important one. And you only, only sent the second one um, or something along those lines. So just, you know, when in doubt, just tell us a little bit more. Okay. Um, any questions about any of this actually, before we skip, a, keep going? No question is too small. So if you have a question, um, we get questions that are like, I'm looking for this on the website. Where is it? You know, because those are actually really quick to answer. Um, so that's not really a problem if you can't find it. I mean, you know, hopefully you'll be able to find things on your own. You know, that's part of what I'm showing you here. But if you do have a little question and you really can't find something, just, you know, that that's also reasonable to, to submit a ticket for. Um, Okay, so what is documentation? We've talked about it a lot, but we want to actually show you what it is. Um, so it's really easy to remember docs.nurse.gov. Um, and this is our technical documentation. So this is where we have all kinds of information on how to actually use our system. Um, and this is where you'll, you know, we have some getting started stuff. Uh, very soon we'll have a beginner's guide. Um, I'm in the process of merging it into this um, uh, documentation. So it's basically going to cover a lot of the stuff that we're covering today. Um, but with the commands, you can just like copy and paste directly into your um, terminal. Um, and uh, the search is also very good here. So you can actually search for things here. So if you have, you know, whatever like code you're trying to run, you could just type it in the search bar um, and see if we if you can find the documentation for it. Um, there's some how-to guides, uh, depending on what it is. Um, a lot of the applications that we support, um, there will be some um, some amount of like, how do you use this thing? So for example, Jupyter, we have a lot of information to learn more about Conda and using Python. And Jupyter is not just for Python, but it is commonly used for running Python. Um, so there'll be some guides on, um, you know, how to do certain things using Jupyter um, or, you know, whichever application you're looking at. Um, and then another really useful thing is this thing called the job script generator. So if you're not familiar with jobs, this will probably not be relevant to you yet, but probably by the end of tomorrow, you may actually want to use this. Um, but in order to use our system, sometimes you have to basically tell the system, hey, this is what I'm trying to run. Can you please run it for me? And there's a special way to kind of prepare your recipe. You basically have to tell it a bunch of different information. And this job generator is kind of an interactive tool. So you don't have to remember all of the like 
syntax and flags and stuff, you can just specify things here and it'll like create it for you, the actual script on the side. And then you can copy and paste it into a text uh, uh, um, file on the system. So this is really nice because then you don't have to um, remember any syntax yourself. You can just tell it, hey, I'm going to run this application on this many nodes for this amount of time and it'll create it for you. So again, if you don't know what a job is, this isn't familiar to you, don't worry about it. You may want to come back to this uh, once you learn more about submitting jobs. And um, I just want to go a little bit over our NERSC homepage. You've probably seen it and spent some time there, but we have NERSC stock of. Um, so this is a, this is more of our just like general website. It's got, you know, lots of information about you know, what, what are people doing and, um, you know, news articles and, you know, for example, it'll have like information about everyone who works at NERSC and all kinds of um, things just to give you a sense of, you know, what, what we're doing. Um, also, uh, we have an events calendar. Um, so if you go to nurse.gov and you go to events, um, you can actually add this to your own calendar. Um, so for example, I took the screenshot earlier. So we are now on the 12th and you can see this is our like training right here, uh, but also any other, like there's office hours or some other types of trainings or our community calls. Those are all in this events calendar. And if you just add, if you use Google calendar um, or maybe even if you use iCal, um, you might be able to add this and just quickly find all the information you need regarding our different events. The live status page is your best friend. Please check it out and uh, bookmark it. <laughs> um, it's going to be a great resource to you um, to check, hey, is Perlmutter up? Um, so it's it's exactly what it sounds like. It's the status of the site. Um, is Perlmutter up and running? If for some, if some, if we notice something, something is going wrong. Oftentimes the operation staff is really, really fast at putting in some notes or right. This will sometimes change to degraded um, if something isn't quite working right, which means you can probably still use the system, but there might be parts that aren't working, but it's really, uh, you know, sometimes it's helpful for us to get these. Sometimes we notice these things because a user will submit a ticket saying, Hey, something seems to not be working. Um, but if you find something isn't working, like something feels really slow or, you know, you keep getting these weird errors, try checking this live status page first before submitting a ticket. So it's possible we know about it. And um, we may have put some notes of like, hey, just give us 30 minutes. Our engineers are working on it. Um, another thing to know is that if you use Jupyter to sign in or you're running, you know, we saw a lot of people doing machine learning. Maybe you're uh, going to do your setup in, in an interactive session on Jupyter. Um, this, our Jupyter Hub is hosted on this service called Spin, which you saw in the very beginning um, that does our edge services, but it's a lot of like science gateways and stuff. Um, so that's where Jupyter Hub is hosted. If there is a Spin outage, that can mean that there is a Jupyter Hub outage. Um, not always. Um, there might be some nodes here or some notes here that tell you like, hey, something is down. Um, usually we have something on um, the Jupyter Hub website itself that'll say like spin is degraded. So Jupyter might be degraded. Um, so that's another thing to check for. Another thing is spin. Um, basically, it's like running all of these different um, services. And every once in a while, they kind of like refresh. Um, so while sometimes that front end part, the part that you see will show like 500 internal error or something like that. Um, usually that doesn't mean that there was any actual error. It might just mean it's doing this like annoying like, refresh thing. Um, and usually that means just give it a few minutes and refresh your page and come back to it. Um, it usually, and the other thing is because that's just like the front end part of it, whatever's running on Perlmutter will still be running. So when you come back to it, um, you know, so sometimes your notebook kernels may have died, but uh, the actual process will probably complete or continue to run, um, even if that front end part isn't, you know, has this little internal error thing. So sometimes we get these tickets being like, Jupyter Hub is down. And usually it's just like, no, it's just refreshing. Just like give it a couple minutes. Um, so that's sometimes the case with Jupyter. Um, so just as a, a note, you know, if, if if you see that internal error thing, just give it a couple minutes. Um, don't, 
don't immediately submit a ticket. If it's if it takes more than I would say like 20 minutes, then you can submit a ticket and say, hey, something may or may not be working. Um, but usually it can be up to 15 minutes. Sometimes it just needs a second to like get back in. My top tip is if we have disruptive outages listed here, this is where it says planned outages in this on the live status page, add it to your calendar so you can plan ahead. Um, so when I was in grad school, um, our, the system that NERSC had was called Corey. And once a month on a Wednesday, they would have a disruptive uh, maintenance that took the whole day on a Wednesday. And for a while, I would get super caught off guard because I'd be like, oh, I'm going to get all this work done on Wednesday. And then I'd get in and be like, oh, my gosh, the system is down today. I literally can't do anything. And so what I started doing was putting it on my calendar as, you know, Corey will be down, like use this time for something else. And I would plan accordingly. Um, so make sure if you see any of those disruptive outages, you put it on your schedule so you know today it won't be available um, also, don't submit a ticket. <laughs> we know it's down. We did it that way on purpose. Check this first, say, and see if there's maintenance. And then, um, you know, if there is, then you just got to wait. Okay. Um, okay. And we if did we go to uh, IO and we can yeah. talk about some of the community stuff tomorrow's kickoff. Yeah. 